Okay, I think we'll start it when so you can actually get home tonight. I'm actually the one here. Sorry. No problem. So, since I actually have a Wi Fi connection right now, I can show you the solution quickly. And the idea is basically you see down here on the right hand side, you have the small icon. Uh, you just click to get a tab with pollution in it. So if I go navigate somewhere uh, like cnn.com, you can see in the pollution tab here that I visit the CNN website, but all of these other websites get data about me as well, as soon as I go to CNN. So it just sends out data to Twitter, to doubleclick.net, to Facebook, to scorecard research, and to IMR Worldwide. And it's just not, you know, a big news site or some of things like that. If I go to IMDB and I want to check something about a movie, I want you to play every soundtrack for my talks in the future. Uh, if I go to IMDB, it also connects to, you can see, most of the same, but it still sends data about you. And it doesn't have to be, you know, a big risk or something to be afraid of, but just to know that the way the web works right now, is that wherever you go, you share data. You don't just visit that website and, and don't believe that anymore. Pretty much every website you visit, you know, it could be a friendly blog, but it still have a badge or something that sends data to somewhere and keeps on going to another place. So that's collusion. So it's, it's fun to, to look at it and just <coughs> see what it's about. <coughs> if you forgot, if you're tired, I'm still from Sweden. <laughs> um, and the, the good thing to know, this is usually the thing, I, I think you know how the world looks like, but if you go to the US, it's a good thing to show this. Uh, Sweden, long and tall, you know, penis, Switzerland, small, chocolate. Okay? <laughs> so there's also an initiative called Sweden, not Switzerland.com that outlines everything that's actually Swedish. Funnily enough, it's being run by a guy who doesn't live in Sweden anymore, but details. Uh, we should also know about Sweden, and I'm not sure if it shows so far, is that Swedes are very shy. So we're very much introverts. Like, so I'm, I'm on fire right now on the inside. On the outside, I'm quite calm. So we, we're moderate, okay? <laughs> That's the way we do things. That's the way we protest. Still tweeting. And talking just a little about one of our projects uh, with Persona, and it's been known as Browser ID, but it's growing to something bigger, but it's Persona now. And the idea with Persona is basically if you used OpenID or something similar on the web, <coughs> OpenID is good to a certain extent, but it's been too hard for people to use with you know, or using names and similar things like that. So the idea here is basically trying to simplify that and make sure that we have a login that works on all websites, you know, no matter what the web browser you're using, etc. And, and as an extension to that, it's also about your data, how you might be able to save more data about you with Persona. And then you can choose yourself, like they want to share, like if you log in to a website with browser ID, you can choose, like with this website, I want to share this and this much about me. With this other website that I trust, you know, take all of this. Uh, and it's being developed more and more. I'm just going to look quickly at how you actually do it. So if you have a button on your website, if you want to use uh, Persona here, you can get a reference to that button in your page. And then we have navigator.id. So basically what you do is that you just send an assertion. Um, I, well, <coughs> sorry. You send a request to your own website to get some data and you get an assertion back. And when you get the assertion, you can use curl or anything, but you know, do it on the server, not on the client, to a verification service. It could be your own verification service if you want to, or you can use the browser ID verification server. So basically, you send the assertion you got back from your server, and you also say that it's for this website, like mysite.com. And then when you do the verification, if you do it with you know, the browser ID verification service, you get some JSON back. And within the JSON, you get a number of different values. Like for this user, the email address is this, the audience is a website you requested, this is when it's going to expire, and you know, who issued this verification. 
the important part here is for if you're doing a login or something like that, you get back the status and it's okay. When it's okay, it's okay. And of course, really important slide, uh, you can actually log out as well. Amazing. And if you want to, you can read up more on browser ID, but it, it's a very easy way to add sign-in to your website. And also, if you're interested, and it's a nice thing about working from Mozilla, is that all the code for browser ID is available on GitHub. So you can see how it all works, you can build your own service, you can port it wherever you want, but you can see the inner workings, it's not some black box. So drag and drop. Um, we'll fade you in the last slide, so I'm going to go through it anyway now. Drag and drop, and I was talking about the Dutch guy at UBK before. Uh, this is his conclusion of drag and drop in it. Uh, I think it's pretty clear what he thinks. Uh, and the idea with drag and drop is that drag and drop has been around in Internet Explorer since version 5, maybe actually maybe version 4 somewhere, and it's changed a bit. So, with HTML5 and the start specification, they thought that, you know, okay, drag and drop might be a good idea, but the Internet Explorer has had it for a long time. So, what it did was that they reverse engineered Internet Explorer's implementation and then took it to HTML5, and then web browser started to implement it with all the bad things that was around back then as well. So it's, I think it was a good idea to try and be pragmatic, but it didn't work out all that well. So it, it's it's okay for some things. But, so you can have an HTML code, you can have an attribute that says that this bit is draggable, you can drag it around. But you can also have any kind of element that you say is going to be a drop area within your web page that you can drop files on. And the way you start coding it is basically that you can, for instance, let's say that you're going to start dragging an image within your page and you're going to drop it somewhere else. Then you have a few different things that you work with. And the first one is using data transfer. And with data transfer, you can say, okay, if I'm going to drag this image on top of this drop area, what kind of information do I want to, to bring? In this case, it's just taking the alt text, but it can be any kind of data attribute, you know, an ID or something, so you actually know what kind of connection you want to set up. And then, <laughs> this is a fun thing from the specification, on the area you want to drop things, you have to have the events drag enter and drag over, and then cancel them for it to work. If you don't cancel those two events, the drop event is never going to be triggered. So it's kind of you know weird, black, messed up my idea. But if you do that, if you cancel those events, you can actually use on drop. And when you use on drop, you check the data transfer object again. Okay, what kind of data do you take with you? Okay, it was the alt text fantastic, and then you can do something with it. The nice thing with <coughs> drag and drop, um, actually, forgive me now, I didn't prepare this. Not being spontaneous. Uh, is that you, if I talk slower, it's going to be much better than that. Uh, so you can have a web page like this, this, this. and you have, can have a drop area, and then you can use file, and you can go through a number of files. But the way you can also do, and this is when it becomes powerful, is that you can take a number of files from your desktop, you can drag it into the web browser, you can actually read out the file's data directly on the client. And this is where it becomes interesting because drag and drop is mostly a mess. But when you can start interacting with the native operating system, then it becomes useful. Because you know, if you use a mail client or anything like that, you drag things into your web browser. And that's the way you work. Why shouldn't the web browser support that as well? You can also, if you want to, use your own icon for drag and drop. Uh, and the thing there is basically that you, you know, set the drag image. Uh, you have a reference to any kind of image you want to. But you can also make sure that you know, if you set the image, you can move the cursor around. So you can have an offset if you want to, X and Y, so it looks better and not just overlap by the thing you're dragging or something like that. Why do I have this? Why do I want that kid to die so much? Sorry. Another thing that's coming now in HTML5 that's really good, that we, for a long time we had full screen in Flash. And full screen is you know, a nice way to get a good user experience, especially if you're building games or something like that. 
In case you get something, you don't get the browser pro and buttons and all that. And the way it looks right now, it's implemented in Firefox and Google Chrome. In Firefox, you go into full screen mode, and the browser tells you that you know, this is full screen mode. Press escape to get out. Uh, in Google Chrome, it does more or less the same thing. It says which website you're on, it says that it's full screen, and which key combination to press to get out. And the way you do it in JavaScript uh, is that, again, let's say you have a button on your web page, is that you request full screen for an element. And this doesn't have to be the entire web page. You can choose a button on your page or a div element or something more useful like a video. And if you want that video to be full screen, you request full screen from, from it. And then you turn it into full screen. In this example, uh, just some extra code to make it work in more than one web browser, is that in this case you're going to do full screen of the entire web page. You get a reference to the button and element you request full screen for that. But it could be any element. And when you do that, in Google Chrome, you can say, set a flag, say that, okay, when you're in full screen, accept all kind of keyboard input. But there's a risk with that as well, and we don't allow that in Firefox. Uh, and basically, you know, phishing or any kind of thing, that if people can do something full screen, they can take something, people put in their credit card number, and then they get slightly upset. So with, <coughs> with Firefox, we're suggesting another method which would be request full screen with keys. So you're going to get all kind of keyboard support when you're in full screen. Uh, but then, of course, we need some kind of warning to the user so they are aware of what's actually going on. This is going into full screen, you know, just as with collusion. Just being aware of what's happening. If that's fine, go ahead. Then, of course, there's a delicate balance how to do that because, you know, we're developers, we know how things work. But most users are more like, oh god, the dialogue, and then they shoot themselves. <laughs> so we're trying to find a delicate balance there to make sure that people know what's happening, but they're not going to be terrified by it. And that's quite a challenge. And when you go into full screen, we also have a number of pseudo classes in CSS. Uh, so in this case, let's say we make the entire page, the HTML element, full screen. Then the CSS file will know that. You don't have to have JavaScript and have an event and change the class of the element or something like that. You can just say that, as you saw before in the screenshots, if you make this page full screen, I want the entire background to be red. Or I might want to display a button that, you know, exit full screen or something like that. Very easy, but just add something more in the CSS. But now we're also getting access to the camera. And, uh, you know, now it gets fun, right? So, where it's supported right now is on Google Chrome and on Firefox on Android. And the way you do it is basically you have an input type file element, and you can choose files from there, upload files. And we're utilizing intents in Android. So not just choosing pictures from the gallery that you're already taken, or file expert, or any program you use, but you also get camera as an option. And if you choose camera there, it goes directly into the camera app. You can take a picture of your nice shoes or something else that's going to be useful for the entire web. And when you do that, you can OK the picture you took, or you can cancel it. If you OK it, it gets loaded into the web browser directly. So the way it looks in code is basically an input type file that we had forever. Uh, you have one attribute here that you might not have seen before, which is the accept attribute. And with the accept attribute, you say, what, what kind of files are you going to accept here? In this case, okay, I'm going to accept any kind of image file, the wildcard, you know, PNG, JPEG, etc. And having some more code there and utilizing the file API to get access to the contents of the actual picture you took. So the way you do that, if you choose files, you have an on-change event in the code, uh, you have a reference to all the files that were chosen. So in this case, we get a reference to the first file we chose. And then we can use something that's quite cool in web browsers, which is object URLs or blob URLs. And this is basically like a grid representation of the contents of the file. So you might be having work with base 64 or beta URLs in general, which are long URLs, right? And this is only a few characters describing the actual image. Uh, and the nice thing here is if you create one of these URLs to the image, you can have an image element in your page. So the picture you just took of yourself, you upload it through the file element, you create an object URL, and you set that as a source to an image in that page. 
which is quite nice. So like you saw before, I was dragging files into the web browser and you see them directly. This is more or less the same thing, but a bit more sophisticated. Just take a picture of yourself and see it directly in the web browser. No server interaction or nothing else like that. Just know, is, are you okay with this picture? You want to upload it? Yes, go ahead. And to make it much, much more richer, and the only thing that I'm talking about that is not really released yet, is WebRTC. And WebRTC is real-time communication on the web. So you can set up a connection between two web browsers and you know share data. It doesn't have to go through a server or anything like that. So what you can do with WebRTC is that you can get live streams. So you use a method called get user media. And get user media accepts three different parameters. And the first one, of course, is the interesting one. Always the first one. Um, and within there, you specify, OK, what kind of things do I want access to from the user, from the web browser? In this case, I only want access to the webcam, the video stream that comes from the computer. But I can also have more parameters. I can say that I want access to the audio. I want access to whatever you can think of. Um, and when you get that access, you have two different, uh, you have one on success event handler and one on error event handler. And with the on success event handler, it's quite easy. So you can have a video element in your page. Let's say it's named live video. And when you have a success connection to the video camera, you get a stream right away. So if I call this function in the web browser, I can see myself live in the web browser. Um, and that might be fun. But then, of course, you can share it with someone else as well. And that's when it gets really interesting. You know, when you start building things like video chats, etc., directly in JavaScript on the web. So the way it is right now, we only have the special builds of Firefox. Google Chrome has it in one of their latest things if you start Chrome with a certain flag. Opera is having it in their alpha releases right now. Uh, so it's on the verge of happening. In a few months down the line, it's going to be out there in some form. Can you, can you use that uh, as a hub, for instance, connecting uh, several browsers instead of two and so Right. So, so the question is, you can use it more as a hub and have more than two connections, just direct connections. The, uh, as far as I know, we have this idea that you're going to be able to connect a lot of things. But it's being, it's being discussed and slightly changed every day. So it's, I'm sure it's going to happen, because that's the thing. If you only get two people, that's OK. But if you're many people, that's better. Right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm sure it's going to happen. I'm just not sure it's really when it's going in there. And then if you build games, you have the pointer.api. And I've been saying this before, but the first time I, I gave this presentation a few days ago, I realized that I had a kid in it. And I hate people having kittens in their presentations because it's such a cliche thing, right? Uh, but the upside is that this kitten is going to die. So I think it's still OK, right? That's OK use case. So the idea with pointer lock is basically if you build games in the web browser, let's say you do the full screen, etc., it's that you can request pointer lock from the web browser. And when you do that, you get access to the pointer. Like you control what the pointer is going to mean to your web page or game. So if you request pointer lock, uh, you can then have the mouse move event. And then it's up to you to check the x movement and the y movement to see how the user is moving the mouse around. And then you can also have infinite mouse movements. It's not like, oh, I just got to the end of the screen and that's it. It stops. You can just keep on going left if you want to. And the other upside here is that if you request pointer log, is that the cursor in the web browser gets hidden. So, I'm not sure it's going to show that well, but if you look here, you see there's a cursor moving around here. Um, just generally, you have a web GL thing. You're building a game, you run around or something. Building. But then, when it goes into full screen, um, the pointer is gone. So here they requested pointer log, and then you can just move around. You can go 360 all the time if you want to, because it's you who control it now. And you don't see the pointer as well, because seeing the pointer would just be annoying. It would feel like a hacky approach. But the pointer's gone. It's for real. Is it, that's, or does it, it works just like a mobile? Using this, the, the, the finger. Does it use the pointer? Is it tapping? Is it the same using it? Uh, I haven't tried it on a touch device, actually. 
Um, but I, I'm, I assume it's going to be the same thing. Your finger's not going to disappear. That's going to extend the, the that swipe. You know, the event keeps occurring until it fades. Right, so you can keep on going. Like yeah. if you keep on swiping in a certain direction, if the browser doesn't block it, like there's no more room to scroll, it, it's up to you, right? You can keep yeah. on going for three days. You can just keep on spinning in there. So, but I haven't tried it, but it's supposed to work that way. Uh, the most boring part, and probably way too late to talk about it in the evening, is databases on the web. Um, you should also know if you go to Disneyland, you can buy a body part storage box. <laughs> I would put parts of a kitten in it. So, you might have worked with something called local storage. And local storage is key value pairs. You have a key that can be named for what you want to store, and then you have value as text. Quite easy. Uh, the upside of local storage is it's quite easy to use as well. Uh, just coding away with it. The downside is that local storage is not asynchronous. So if you have a big read operation from disk or something like that, it could block the entire user interface thread in the browser. Uh, most of the time, it's not a big risk to you. It depends what you're doing. But another option to that, and that's coming now, uh, is using IndexDB and having a more powerful way of storing things on the client. Um, we used to have WebSQL on the client, but that was only supported in web browsers and in Opera. And Microsoft and Mozilla said that you know that it's good to have a database, but we don't think that WebSQL is the best format. We don't think the syntax is the best format for web. We don't think the SQL database that it's based on was the best one to use. So then, you know, as it always works, people were whining and bitching and talking back and forth, and then they all said, "Well, IndexDB seems cool." So. In this DB, it's being developed to just have a more powerful database. And, and I'm just doing this to kind of show you where we are right now. And you have all of these different prefixes for different web browsers to get access to an index DB database. And you also have it for different transactions right in client. And we can talk about prefixes all night, and it's not fantastic, but that's the way web browser vendors can experiment experiment with things. We can try new things, and if we change the syntax or break it, it's only still a prefix. So the idea, if, if you use it in production, you can do that, but you need to be aware of that it might change. So if you want to take that risk, go ahead. So let's say we created a database here, uh, or get a reference of database. Then we call the open method. So we want to open up a database called elephant files, and we just send in a number, which is the version of the database. <coughs> and when the open method is being called, it checks in the web browser, like, do we have a database by this name already? Um, fine, I'll just work with it. But if we don't have a database with that name, or if the version number that we send in is a higher number than the existing one, we have an event called on upgrade needed. Basically, you need to upgrade in this DB database. So when that is being called, um, we create an object store. And naturally, we're going to create an object store in the database to store objects. And in this case, we create an object store named elephants. So then what we can do, we can do an XML ACP request to our web server. And we can say that you have a lovely picture of an elephant. We want to use that and store that as code in our IndexDB database. So the interesting thing here is that you've probably done Ajax all of you for a long time, is the response type. And here you don't get text back, you get a blob format back. And when you get a blob format back, it's basically talking about the object URLs et cetera before, it's just a short representation of that actual image file's content. So if you get that back, let's say this is 200, you can use that blob and then you call another function to put it in your IndexDB database. So before we set up the way of doing transactions. So let's say that we have our objects or named elephants who want to do a read-write transaction to that database. And then we have a transaction, uh, we get reference to the object store, and then we use the put method to put the blog, the description of the image, into that object store with the key of image. So basically we're going to find it and use the key image. 
as you can see on the next line then, is that we can just reference the same object store again, uh, and then we use the get method. And when we use the get method, we read out the content of the key image. And when that works, it always works, right? Um, we can do the same thing that we did with the camera, camera API before. We just get out that image as code, use an object URL, and then we set it to the source of an image within the web page. Fun and games. Then, of course, you want to make the web richer and richer. We want to give web developers access to as much as we can on the devices. So the battery API is not just about getting access, access to the battery on the phones. It works on <coughs> Windows, and on Firefox and Windows as well. I think it works on Linux, and I should verify recently. It doesn't work on Mac OS X right now, but it's just because of the it's not done yet. That's what it's about. And when you get a reference to um, the battery, you want to check that. Of course, it's all relative how long battery time is going to be left. It's just a big guess game. Like, how long is the gas in the tank in my car is going to last me? It kind of depends. How do you drive? What gear do you use, etc. Same with a computer, you know, how much processor power are you using, how much RAM, etc. But the thing that we expose here is the thing that we get from the operating system. The operating system, <laughs> the operating system tells us that, okay, we have this much power left. So what we can read out at the moment is the battery level. We can also see if it's charging or not, like if it's connected, and how long time it's going to take until it's fully charged, or how long time it's going to take until it's discharged. And the way we do this code, we get the reference to something called MOS battery. And with MOS battery, we check the battery level here, and you know, we get Boolean back if it's charging or not, and then we get integers back if it's charging time or discharging time. We also have different events, like if the battery level is changing, or if the charging status is changing, did you just connect the device? Okay, that's interesting. So, you know, usually people ask, okay, so this is all fun, but what am I supposed to use it for? And the thing here, of course, is what, again, what kind of things do you connect it to? If you have a, a sync operation in the background with WebSockets or something like that, you can see that, okay, the user is not connected, and it's only 5% um, battery power left, maybe you don't want to start a heavy sync operation like that, or in a game, or especially with multiplayer games and things like that. And then we have boot to get -go. Um, boot to get -go, and I have a, uh, uh, a boot to get -go phone here, if someone wants to touch it later. That's not software, you can test the phone. Um, <laughs> And basically what boot to get is building an operating system for phones that is just HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript. So boot to get in, in itself is a way to access all the low-level APIs and how things work in a phone. And then we put Gecko, the rendering engine on Firefox, on top of that. You don't need Android, you don't need iOS. It's very lightweight. And then we create user interface on top of that. So everything you see is just HTML code. Uh, accessing everything we can and that we expose on the phone. And, you know, you can pretty much do everything you expect from a phone. And again, the nice thing here is that the code for Buddha Gecko in itself, it's available on GitHub. It's been there from day one, or day zero if you're a developer. Uh, and we also have our own user interface that we put on top of that, uh, nicknamed Gaia. So Gaia is just HTML code. It's has some JavaScript, of course. Um, and the other thing that's also nice here that we're working together with Telefonica, and by the end of this year, beginning of next year, we're actually going to have the first boot to get phones on the market. Uh, at the moment, Telefonica is using their own database <coughs> that they put on top of boot to get -Go. And that's a nice thing that boot to get is just about sourcing all these things. You can build your own user interface, you don't have to use anything that is there. Um, you can just access all the APIs and build the phone the way you want it to work. And there are three different things you can look into with boot to gecko uh, In general, there's the boot to gecko documentation on MDN that just lists how do you start. Like if I have a phone, which phones can I put boot to gecko on, or you know, what's needed. There's also an emulator for the deep level stuff in boot to gecko uh, only for really the, the brave ones. 
But there's also a way if you just want to use Gaia. So if you don't have a phone, you don't have um, something you can test on, you don't have any emulator, you can still hack Gaia. You can still use, for instance, Firefox nightly and have Gaia locally on your desktop and it runs. So you can just test it on your desktop you just play around. What would you do like building a web application or something directly on a phone? And then we get APIs to, to go with that. And for some reason, it was the first picture I showed up. I was looking for a funny picture with a telephone. It's, you know, paying respect. We haven't talked about it in some time, so it's time to get back to it. Yeah. So how do we access the telephone uh, through JavaScript? Well, quite easy. Uh, you access the MOS telephony object, and then you get a number of different methods and properties on that. So you can check if the phone is muted or not, if the speaker is enabled or not. If you want to call a friend, you use the dial method. Shocking. Uh, and it's just that easy. And it shouldn't be harder than that. If you want to dial someone, then give the phone the number and the phone is supposed to dial that person. And we also have, if you get a call, uh, you have the incoming event. And with the incoming event, you get a reference to the actual call object. And with the call object, you can check, okay, which number is trying to call me right now? And then, of course, you can connect it to some kind of service to see like, if there's someone you actually want to talk to or not. And if you want to talk to that person, we have the answer method. With the answer method, you answer the call. If you want to stop the call, you use the hangout method. And that's all there is to it. And the same thing with SMS. You have a MOS SMS object. Uh, this gets complicated now with two parameters. Uh, you want to send an SMS, choose the number you want to send it to, and the text you want to send to that number. And then you have the received event, like when you get a text message to someone, you receive it, you have the event object, and you check the message you got. We also have vibration. I'm, I'm sure you can tell me which movie this is from. Anyone? Thank you. Jurassic Park. In Inception. Is, is there a glass in Inception? There isn't. E everything was in Inception, so that, uh, that's a valid answer, I guess. No, it's, it's actually from Jurassic Park. But do you know how they did the, the effect? The Tyrannosaurus so, actually one. Yes, exactly. So they had a uh, kind of piano wire on top of it, and it kept on playing on it, and it gives vibrations, and the glass vibrates. So I'm sorry, no dinosaur. It could have been. Um, <laughs> So with vibration, how do we make the phone vibrate? So we have the MOS vibrate method. Uh, just a, a number of different buttons in the web page you can try on mobile. And what we do is that we call MOS vibrate, and the value we give it is in milliseconds. So the first example here is a thousand, which basically means that the phone is going to vibrate for one second. The second one is more interesting, because here you can have intervals. So you give it an array, so it's first going to vibrate for 200 milliseconds, then it's going to be silent for 100 milliseconds, then it's going to vibrate for 200, etc. So you can make your own songs by vibrating. Don't do that. Uh, but you can. You can also try and see how long your phone is actually going to play nice with you and vibrate. Uh, I can only make it vibrate for 5 seconds, but that's, that's not that much fun. Uh, and if you want to cancel it, you can call muscle ring just with zero, which just ends the current vibration if it's vibrating. And all of these APIs that I've been going through here is part of a bigger project called Web API with Mozilla. And the idea with Web API is basically that all of these things that we work on, to begin with, they are being developed and prototyped in the open. We want as much people as possible to see them and give input on them. If you don't think they're moving in the right direction or something's missing or just love it, uh, you can take part of that. You can see what's happening. And the other thing, of course, is that if we were to work only on APIs that would work in Firefox and boot to Gecko and that's it, that would also be a waste. So we have a number of people from that API being part of the device API working group with W3C to make sure that it's being standardized. So when we reach a certain point, we want everyone to agree that, okay, this is a good way to do it. We want you to do that on your phone or in your web browser as well. Because, you know, building for just one web browser or one platform, that's, that's all news. That's not how we do it anymore. 
We also have DevTools in, in Firefox, like everyone has been using Firebug for a long time. And with DevTools, we're trying to build a complement to Firebug. It, it's more lightweight, it's by default directly in the web browser. It doesn't have everything that Firebug has, has but it has most of the things you probably might need. So the nice thing here is that you, know, you can select element in the page. And the, the good part I like mostly is you got the hierarchy down here. You can just see ah, top one. You can just see how the page is being built up. You can use the arrow keys to just move around in the web page and the structure. And on the right hand side, any kind of styles that you want to manipulate. We also have something in the developer tools called um, 3D. Uh, and the idea with using 3D or the, the tilt feature is to see a web page in 3D. And the way you do is you basically just, depending on how deep the structure goes in the web browser, you get a different kind of nesting. And we were talking about main, Minecraft before, and you know, someone sent us this thing, you can see this web page, and that's all good and well. When you go into 3D, you see that someone actually built a Minecraft level by using HTML elements. You just use different HTML elements, and different elements give different colors. So this is just the DOM of a web page. It just looks like this. Uh, but just checking how it is, you can create whatever you want. And that's the cool thing. I mean, when you build a tool like this, you don't expect anyone to build a Minecraft level. But that's what's so fun about it. It's something new and something different. And when we talk about all these APIs, the way we want to do it is that we want you to take part of it. So we have different releases uh, of Firefox, and, and the most important one, I would say, is Aurora, because Aurora is before we have settled on something. People can still test things, and if you find bugs or think just something is wrong with it, this is where you can stop it or make it better. Uh, and you know, no one wants to work on something hard and then just release it, and then everyone says, like, oh no, that's wrong, or it doesn't work. So this is where you can actually take part, you can actually you know, shape how it's going to be. So we have our different releases of Firefox, and it's basically six-week releases, or release cycles. So we have nightly releases, which is, of course, every night. Uh, but then we have Aurora as the next step after nightly. So in Aurora is the final step before we, you know, if it goes through the six weeks of Aurora state, that's it. It's more or less going to be released un unless we find something really critical in there. And after Aurora, it goes into beta, and beta you can just become the final polish or find a crucial bugs. And after the six weeks later, it actually gets released. So it's just good to know about this and where to get involved as well and when you can affect things. And with all these APIs, it's just trying to get you to do something new, but not, not to do the things you've been doing all the time. And you know, get out of your comfort zone and start playing around. It doesn't, you don't have to be like everyone else. You can be the guy with a gun and gun in practice. <laughs> I don't know why you would be bring a gun to a band practice. Anyway, and uh, I just saw this on Facebook last night. You can build whatever you want, okay? You're in control. If you want to build this, fantastic. Oh, my God, that was great. That's so <laughs> But you can do something like that. And at the same time, when talking about conduct on the web, uh, you know, you can waste a lot of time fighting with other people. But if you just want to kill the other people's streams, that's, you know, that's okay, I guess. But it's a waste of your time, and it's a waste of everyone else's time. So rather work together and build things and, and take care of each other. Um, my favorite TV show, Lost, has this quote that, you know, so we saved the world together for a while, and that was lovely. And that's the way I want to see how I spend my life. That's how I want to see how Mozilla spends his time. That's how I want you to spend your life. You can do whatever you want, but you also have an option of actually saving the world, of small steps of making the world better. So I, I hope you chose, choose to do that. I'm a voice anymore, so thank you. <laughs>